Uh, I don't know Lamar is our song leader. What I don't see back here. So let me see. Um, we might need a song leader. <laughs> <laughs> Book is not finished by weight. So when you say, hey, there's only 14 checks, that's all. The uh, person putting it together. <laughs> that's exactly right. Nobody has complained yet. I mean, about the not having material speed, that's another question. Take your time. I got us a time. Uh, well, I'm just going to have you back here in a second. Can I have you lead it with a word of prayer? Um, I'm going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, something that uh, I think is something that I struggle with. That, dare I say, I kind of think some of us, uh, some of you too, struggle with. And it's the matter of grumbling. I want to talk about that tonight. I want to think about those things. Uh, uh, as I said, something that I, that I struggle with, and I think you struggle with. Uh, it's going to be worth it for all of us to spend some time. And before we get started tonight, Brian, uh, could we ask you to do some more prayer? Sure, Brian. Father, man, we thank you for this opportunity. We have this Wednesday night to gather together and study the Bible and pray as we approach uh, the topic of grumbling tonight. We might. Look at our own attitudes and how we're approaching the, the different aspects of our life and make sure we have the proper attitude in our lives. Pray for Brian that he might have a good remembrance of this lesson. We also pray for the members that are away tonight, whether they're sick or traveling, that they may be able to come back to the sick. We pray that we always cherish the opportunities we have to come together and regard that as an important priority in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Our key passage tonight is out of the book of James, chapter 5. Uh, James 5 itself has a lot of one another passages. It has your sins to one another, pray for one another. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Grumbling, complaining. We're going to use a bunch of words tonight that the, uh, the scriptures give us about these things. And... Um, you know, if you wanted to have a long study about grumbling and complaining, where might you go in the Bible? Right off the top of your head. Talk to you the Old Testament? Go back to the Old Testament. And who would you be visiting? You're uh, right. Uh, Moses? You'd go back to Moses' day and you'd visit those Israelites. Who are, the Bible says, a lesson for us. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, remember the Israelites who were just like us. They were delivered uh, from oppression, they were baptized, he says they, uh, they entered a covenant with God, and then they were struck down, and of course he points to several different things, immorality, idolatry, and grumbling, and complaining, and that's an interesting thing to think about, I might call it one of those Corinthian problems, one of the problems that the church in Corinth had, uh, they have of course a, a big problem with disunity, uh, trying to get themselves to work together, to get themselves together. And there's a lot of complaints about each other. Um, you know what? I was kind of thinking about that, uh, the different complaints. And here's what's interesting. Were some of the complaints valid? You look up the board and say, well, Brian, right there, you said yes. So, yeah. Uh, so, what, do you remember what happened in 1 Corinthians 5? Anybody put out of your head? It's kind of a tough one to ask you to remember a chapter, but 
There was a guy that they were complaining about at church, Tony. Yep, God had his father twice. Yes. So there are people reporting that to Paul, saying, Paul, we got a problem. We got a problem. Some of these complaints, we would say, are valid. By the way, I have a rule about complaints. In some ways, all complaints are valid. If somebody says, you know, Brian, you, you talk too fast or you talk too loud, well, yeah, that's probably true. Um, I didn't like, we went to a movie recently and, and uh, some of our people said, I didn't like that movie. And I thought, no, they're wrong because it was a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's perfectly reasonable. A lot of times the idea of a complaint is that if somebody says it was a problem, then it necessarily it was a problem. So in some ways, some complaints are valid. First Corinthians chapter 8, though, they talked a lot about eating meat sacrificed to idols, and some of the people may have been complaining about others that were doing that. And Paul said, well, you know, you're allowed to do that. So we could say some complaints were valid, some weren't so valid. But I think what's fascinating is there's a, you know, the, here's a big word, schema. There's a schema that Paul is trying to get the Corinthians to put together on how to deal with complaining. And it's one that I hope that we can kind of put together for ourselves, the schema of how to complain or how not to complain. And the part of the issue is, is that there is a sense where, we kind of talked about already, that if some complaints are valid, there might be a way to complain, but, but sometimes they're not. And the interesting thing is, if we're not complaining appropriately, even if the complaint is valid, it's not productive. That's something I want us to think about for a few minutes tonight. The idea of, even if I have a valid complaint, maybe just the complaint or the grumbling itself could render it invalid. Um, June verse 16 says something interesting that I always uh, like to look at. And I like it particularly in the New American Standard. So, somebody have New American Standard? New American Standard. Verse 16. Go ahead. No, Jude. Verse 16. These are grumblers finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gain and advantage. I want, I want to camp on this term uh, that he uses here. And uh, New King James, he just says grumblers, complainers. But I like this term, finding fault. Fault finding. Fault finding. I really like the term because there's something kind of important about fault finding. You know, uh, Ryan, uh, you just came back from Italy. And you were basically fault finding, weren't you? You went out to look at, uh, I don't know what, I have no idea. <laughs> He's told me, but it's something to do with propellers, right? So he looks at propellers and tests them and sees whether or not they have a fault. If they have a fault, well, like Hoover Dam would collapse or something, right? You know, it's something to do that we have electricity because of this. So he's running a test. You buy a new car. You're going to be driving it around this thing for a problem. So, so we kind of think sometimes fault finding is good. But, you know, Jay, Jude is saying it's bad. Somebody help me out. Help me figure this one out. Uh, what, when is fault finding a sin? When is it good? And this is kind of trickier than you think, maybe. But, but I want to hear what you think. But what is it wrong? What is it right? What do you think? So, as Stephen just read, he puts a condition on the fault finding, following after their own lust. Mm. arrogantly flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So I guess it depends completely on what is your oh. reason for fault finding. Okay. What is your agenda? Becky, you just gave us the thing that we really want to camp down on. What is your purpose and intent? We're going to throw out two ideas, actually. What is your purpose and intent? Now, he talked about things like arrogance, pride, or, you know, envy, or... Or, or different things like that. Number one, I want us to sit down on purpose and intent. Why am I finding fault? The trick is, it's not about the fault you're finding. It's about your purpose and intent. Now, that's kind of important. Let, let me confess my sin to you. Let me tell you, and I don't mean it lightly. I mean, it really is wrong. There are times where I think I look at another preacher. Maybe his video comes across. He's very popular. And I'll listen into his sermon. And I realized after a while, you know what I'm listening to find? Yeah, you know, you know, and it's wrong. It is wrong. I am breaking what he said here. Because my intention 
is that because of envy, boy, preachers envy each other. We are the worst for doing it. It's a real struggle, you know. Uh, you know, I'm listening, and sometimes I'll catch myself thinking, you know, why am I listening? And I'll have to say, you know, I just can't even listen. I might have got some benefit out of a good lesson, but I can't do it because my intent is wrong, and I'm breaking the commandment of God. So intention. What's the other thing that comes into this? Kind of similar to intention. Let's say attitude. Intention and attitude. <clears throat> If my and, and attitude speaks less to the idea of fault finding and more to the idea of grumbling and complaining. What's the attitude behind grumbling and complaining? Ungrateful. Ungratefulness, a lack of gratitude. Boy, that's that's actually going to be a big one when we come back here in a few moments and ask the question: How do you fix this? We're going to have to sit on that idea too. What else do you think? So one, of the, one of the things that I find amazing is we have many different denominations who believe the same as we do, but find fault in each other the way they believe. And that has always puzzled me, because if you believe in Jesus Christ, how can you find fault? You know, what's interesting about that is that uh, the Word of God would want us to be, what's another word? You know, we say, oh, I don't want to use the word fault fine, but what would be a positive term you could use? United. Unity, okay. I like discernment, critical thinking, yeah, critical observation. And to be fair, uh, if somebody does have a different doctrine, it's like the whole book of Second John is all about, hey, if somebody has a different doctrine, you got to watch out for that. So there's, it's an interesting thing Michael brings up, the idea of, you know, you know what, what are we doing sometimes? Because the Word of God tells us, hey, examine all things, cling to what's good. What do we do with what's, the things that aren't good? Reject them. You know, I kind of think of Ephesians 5 and 11 where he talks about the idea of, you know, don't have fellowship with, with things that are darkness, but expose them. But there's a fine line here. And I would suggest to you that the fine line is things like purpose and intent and attitude and attitude. And that the irony is a person can be a godly person accomplishing something important or they can be on the side of sinning and fault finding, and it can be the exact same thing that they're doing. Intent and purpose, attitude. Uh, Debbie, and then bring So does motive work into either one of these? Because I might find fault in expecting the Lord to do something you know, increase, increase my favor. I, I think that's what Jude meant when he said it was about the idea of pride and boastfulness, uh, that a lot of times what we do when we're proud is we drive down somebody else to keep feeling good, you know? Uh, somebody says, you know, the Brian, your son, great, sure does have a nice head of hair. I say, yeah, well, you know, he's not as smart as me. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you, you say, I don't want to, I don't want to have that competition, so I might drive somebody down to do that. So yes, motive, intent, and purpose. I would say motive fits nicely with intent and purpose to say, why am I doing it? And Jude says, sometimes we're doing it because we're proud. Uh, Gregor? Well, speaking about denominations specifically, specifically, Paul tells us that if you change the gospel one iota, it is a different gospel. Yeah. And what we have to be careful of is, is not trying to, I mean, I think we should listen to what the others say to make sure we, we are or not in fellowship with them and fellowship being that we have the same belief system. But I know there's a lot of people out there who I, we can talk to scriptures all day long as long as I don't bring up baptism. Yeah, right. You know, we, right. So many things we agree on absolutely perfectly, yet the scripture is very clear it's a requirement. Yes. Um, you know, and, and I, I have met people that think circumcision to this day is a requirement, sure. even though it's specifically expressed in the gospel, it's not. So, again, that but that falls to your intent. Am I listening and discussing with them to find the truth, the truth that is God's word, or am I doing it to feel better? If, if I'm doing it to for my own internal reasons, it's probably bad. So Gregor gave you two good sermon points here. Number one, Galatians 1, uh, if you change, and Gregor mentioned circumcision, if you change, and in the case of Galatians 1, they had, they had suggested, well, you ought to be circumcised, which isn't even a sin. 
But if you add it to the law of Christ, you create another gospel, and Paul said, and then you become a curse. Big deal. Uh, number two, Gregory gave us a brief and good lesson on fellowship, and Gregory even gave us a little, and fellowship is that they're in Christ, and we're in Christ, and that's worth examining. So two good points about that. Go ahead, Gregory. Yeah, I was kind of thinking maybe one other thing to add to this would be the idea of um, what we do when we do find a fault. Um, you know, it's if I find a problem in someone else, even not looking for fault, um, you know, if I'm driving down the road and I see you pull into a bar and I say, oh, he's doing something wrong. I wasn't looking for it. <coughs> You know, I could do multiple things with that information. You know, I could go to you and I could, you know, try and talk to you about it. I could gossip about it. You know, there are other things. Right. Great. You're actually, you're actually bringing us to our last points, which are important. Let me just plug it down for you. You will never be successful in Christ in discerning if you're not a fault fixer while you're a fault finder. Now, that's Paul in Corinthians. Paul doesn't say, hey, guys, I heard you have a guy there that's living in sin. I can't believe it. Paul says, hey, guys, this is what you need to do about that. Hey, guys, I heard that you make the Lord's Supper ridiculous. Uh, I have a problem with that. No, he says, hey, guys, this is why you're supposed to do it. It's very easy to find fault. Uh, you know, a famous preacher once said, I can cut the denomination apart all day. That's not hard to do. It's hard to do is to try to get people to do what's right. Paul didn't sit around to the Corinthians and say, I heard this, I heard this, I have a problem with this, I don't like this. <coughs> Paul said, you need to fix this by doing this. You need to fix this by doing this. Brothers and sisters, the big idea we're going to walk away with tonight, the thing that I need us to put in our head, you cannot be fault finders, you must be fault fixers. And now, I go from there, but in, in the end, it's judging. You know, um, Matthew 7 talks about judging. Do not judge. You know, um, or you could at least you be judged. And then it talks about the, you know, the, the speck in your brother's eyes compared to the log in your own eye. You know, is that, and, and, and the, the grumbler, what are you doing? You know, you're looking something wrong uh, yes. you, against your brother. Let me jump back, Anthony, because you know? what you're saying, what's so interesting, is that when James said don't do it, he goes to the idea of judgment. He says, the judge, and he talked about this before. He said, don't speak evil of your brother. Don't, you know, if you're judging, you become the lawgiver. You know, he, he tries to make that clear that you don't have a place just to say, you're wrong, and that's it. The scriptures say, our place is to say, you're wrong, here's what's right. You're wrong, here's what needs to happen. And that's the scripture example that too many times we don't follow. And that's going to be the big thought. I think somebody else had a hand. Go ahead. Say. So another thing that I think about with this is uh, we've all been around those people that just complain, they complain, complain, complain. Yes. And we're to be the light in the world. We're not to be, they bring me down. And I'm around yeah. somebody that's, that's negative, 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 brings me down and it, and it dims my light. So let's, let's so hang on that idea. Just to the point of grumbling. Because what we don't appreciate is that fault finding, grumbling, complaining, is one of the deadliest characteristics among brethren that we can have. Poison. It's what killed Israel. Uh, it's why all of their bodies are in the wilderness, so to speak. We want to kind of keep that in mind. In fact, a couple of questions. Let me ask you this. Uh, let me ask you, number one, what do you guys complain about? I'm prepared to tell you what I complain about. Um, you know, I complain about you didn't like the elections. I complain. I don't like the price of gas. I complain. What are you complaining about? Yeah. Sometimes what I complain about is what I perceive as like a person that I think is unreasonable. They're unreasonable to me, but that doesn't mean they're truly unreasonable. That's a nice one. Uh, Complaining about unreasonable people. If Mrs. Haynes was here tonight. <laughs> she would say, I complain about incompetent people. <laughs> she, she'll, she'll say that a lot. That, but she, and by the way, that answer is number, uh, number three for her, because she'll tell me that. Interesting point. Okay. Um, along the same lines, accountability. If people aren't accountable, that. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> Just be good. Mike, what are you complaining about? 
When I was mentioning different denominations, Jehovah's Witness people come round to your house and talk to you. And I brought up the fact that they don't believe in military service. Yeah. And they blew their tops. Yeah. <laughs> and then I showed them military photographs and medals that I have. Yeah. And I said, we don't have anything we can discuss. But they couldn't explain to me why that was. I get frustrated, Michael, with people that are unreasonable in their beliefs. You know, that don't want to talk about it. That's nice. How about anybody complain about getting older? <laughs> Anyone? No. No, I'm great. Yeah. <laughs> the alternative, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we think of something like getting older. And that's some serious complaint, right? Uh, that's Ecclesiastes chapter 12 level stuff, right? Where the writer of Ecclesiastes says, hey, you know, there's a point in your life where all you see is the worst of things sometimes. He says, that's, that's what a bad mindset towards age can do. And the point is, we complain. Sure. It's not, I'm not even telling you it's wrong. Um, but it's important for us to understand uh, what is it that we're talking about. Who do you complain about the most? I, I mentioned, you know, I, I, I give our politicians who God said, Brian, you need to pray for them. I complain about them. I have a really hard time not complaining about the owner of our company because of his immoral behavior yeah. and his unethical behavior. Let's, let's add to what Teresa said. Does anybody complain about work? Anybody complain about co-workers, supervisors? <laughs> hey, wait a second, you're retired. <laughs> yeah. If Al raised his hand, I'd be really curious what that means. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. For, for. Yeah, sure, that's, that's another one. Um, you know, one of the worst things I hate to hear is when people complain about their family. You know, oh, my, my husband or wife. Um, oh, I hate that because there's, that's that's a really terrible thing. Parents, children. Oh, well, okay, you know, that's fair. But I'll let you have that, Grant. <laughs> but, you know, we do, we complain a lot. We talk about a lot of people, and then we say, to whom do you complain about? Well, just tell me in a general sense, who do you complain the most to? Whoever listens. Whoever listens, I like that. Your spouse. So I usually complain to the people I'm closest to. You're going to hear the most. So you know what that means? That means everybody else gets to meet nice, friendly Brian. But Wendy hears a Brian that just complains all the time. And Brent hears that guy sometimes. And uh, uh, I saw some hand pointing. I'm not going to say who, uh, Richie. But, uh, you know. And I think that brings up a point. Uh, when we complain, we have to be really careful that we're not complaining about people in the church when yes. people in the world can hear us. Yes. Or, when, or even when our young children who can't understand it can hear us. So we have to be really, really important, not just to whom we complain, but when we do it and I'm, where we do it. I'm going to throw out to you that one of the most terrible statistics in the church is how many times preachers have their kids fall away. All of you know that. You all know that that's a pretty common thing. And we lay it at the foot of complaint. That's usually what happens. And by the way, you know, preachers have some doozies of complaints, you know. But the problem is when you put that out there among the people you're closest to, they really suffer for it. My kids suffer for it. My wife suffers for it. My complaining, not, not my position, my complaining. And that is probably why we see such a bizarre statistic of so many preachers whose children don't stay faithful because we're not careful about the very thing Debbie said, Tom. Yeah, along that lines, uh, probably one of the biggest reasons that I actually came around uh, to worshiping is because Susie's mother would always tell her and to never, ever say anything bad nice. about the church. When you come home, when I've been watching the ball game, and uh, she comes home and you know, the singing was lousy, and the preacher did a lousy job. And, uh, but never, ever did, once did I hear anything from her, and mm -hmm. that was because directly to her mother. Uh, because most of us know that when you have a congregation of 50, 60, 70, 80 people, you can nitpick and you find absolute massive amounts of things. Well, not massive amounts. You can find things to upset you and to complain about. Um, 
about the service. And I think that's one of the biggest warnings that needs to be thrown up. We talked about Trump. Absolutely. I wanna, What's the target? Well, it better not be the church. I want to move to something because we're going to come back to that. Because the important question I ask you towards the end here is, does anybody follow a complainer to heaven? Well, and that's, that goes to what Tom said. So here's Paul warning the, the uh, Christians in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 10. He says, hey, look, remember, don't complain like they complained and they were destroyed. Remind me, what was it that the Israelites were complaining? Food. Was that a legitimate complaint? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I've got a couple other things. Tacho? Water? No. Water? They were thirsty. Is that a legitimate complaint, Tacho? Oh, Stephen? Yeah, yeah. Water? What else were they complaining about? Man, we had, they just, when they had food, oh, we're tired of me. Why'd you bring us out in this wilderness to die? Why didn't you leave us back in Egypt? Yeah, yeah. Why didn't you leave us there, Bonnie? Leadership. Leadership. Who were they complaining against? Moses. Moses. They didn't like Moses. What was the thing that... Oh, go ahead. They also was grumbling about, about after God destroyed some of them. Um, AI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, and they grumble to Moses after, you know, because of what happened. Um, they grumble sometimes because, like, Korah's rebellion seems yeah. to fit in with some of that, with God punishing them, and they grumble about that. <laughs> what was the big thing that God said, that's it, I'm had it with you, you don't get to go in the promised land. What was the thing that broke the camel's back, do you remember? What was the thing? When they all... The 12 spies go into the land, come back. What are you going to say? Well, I guess here's the first thing I would ask. Before I, you guys give me the right answer, let's start back and say, what did all 12 say? Great land. And then what did it say? We're not going to make it. Oh, we've been let out here and there's no way we can do it. What did two say? You know what's fascinating? They all saw the same land. Now, this is the thing, this is the thing that we want to consider here is the idea that there are times where we all see the same thing. We're in the same congregation. And sometimes we're in the same congregation <laughs> and some of us see all the bad things, but then a few of us see all the good things. And who's right? We're all seeing the same thing, but who's justified by God? According to the Israelites, who is it? The ones that see what's good. Jesus will tell us something in the book of Luke uh, in a, probably a few months, the way we're moving. In a few months, we'll see Jesus say something about if your eye is darkness, how great is that darkness within you? He said, The eye is the lamp of the body. That eye is darkness. You know what he meant by that? He was describing the idea that if it's kind of like this door at night, you know, uh, does that door ever trick you whenever the sun's setting and you think it's really dark outside? You open the side, oh, it's not. If that door, you're looking out at, what does it look like outside? Oh, it looks dark. If your eye is dark, if it's got a negative filter, everything you see will be dark. And Jesus said, if that's the case, you're just going to be full of darkness. Now, this is an important thing. What kind of world do we live in today? I'm going to trick you. So, what's your answer? What kind of world do we live in today? It's awful, right? It's the worst we've ever lived in. Nothing's been this bad. And we don't see things like, yeah, except for the fact that, you know, my, all of my grandparents died in their 60s of diseases that today are taken care of. Um, you know, we, uh, we just had uh, 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 Michael's parents visiting with us, and, and Michael's mom was talking about she had, uh, you know, surgery on her cataracts, and they corrected her vision. Now she sees perfectly, you know. Well, <laughs> and the point is, we're so prone to seeing all that's wrong and not saying things like, you know, in human history, people have not had better access than the Bible than we do today. You know, how, how many Bibles do you have at home? I've got a lot. My great-grandparents had one. My great-great-great-great-great-grandparents probably had to borrow one to ever get to read it, if they got to read it. But we see the worst. And that's not a good thing. And that's why I was always telling the kids when they were young. 
need to stop looking at the glass half empty. Yeah. To look at the glass half full. Yeah. Because there's yes, there's a lot of bad stuff. There's a lot of good stuff. Yes, and and the point is, is that's true of every single thing that there is, you know, and that's that's the kind of thing that. Well, let's go back to this question. The question is, uh, going on about the grumbling. What? What? Why was grumbling? Why is grumbling so offensive to God? With the Israelites, why was God so angry that He said, "That's it. You don't get to come to the promised land." Because he provides everything for us and we're totally ungrateful for it. He, he gave them food every day. All you can eat buffet. In a, in a time in human history, that's a, such a thing had never happened. He, their enemies couldn't touch him. They, you know, their shoes didn't wear out. He did everything for them, George. The reason God gave was that they didn't believe him. They did not believe him. You know, it's kind of funny, by the way, he even said that to Moses at one point. Uh, was it Tancho or Ryan? Oh, yeah, no faith. no faith. Yeah, yeah, no faith, no faith. They don't, they don't believe God. They're just constantly saying, "Well, God let us out here to die." God was furious <laughs> about that. Now, let's say this though. Let's understand this. Ten men show up and start grumbling in the camp. Only ten men. And what happened? This goes back to what Becky said. Everybody else following. Everybody else following. <laughs> One of the most infectious diseases known to humankind is complaining. And it's spread about the camp worse than any disease ever. And pretty soon, everybody had it. And everybody caught complaining. And the truth about complaining is, it's absolutely contagious. Why does God hate grumbling? Because it's one of the worst social diseases there is. We catch it from each other, and we've all said it. Even if I try to have a good attitude when I'm, you know, and, I, and again, i got to give Joshua and Caleb their bit that they stuck with it, even though everybody else was saying how bad it was, that that complaining is absolutely contagious. Now, can you see why God loathes complaining? Number one, it completely dismisses every good thing he's done. Number two, George said it, and that's right. It completely invalidates the idea of faith that I may be worried about what's going to happen, but I trust God's going to take care of it. And number three, it will cost you your soul, plus the souls of those around you. So of course God hates complaining. Of course God hates grumbling. Of course God uh, is, is constantly in the New Testament saying, don't complain, don't grumble, don't complain. Don't complain against each other. Don't complain against God. Because it's deadly. You know, things like lust or covetousness or things like that, they're not nearly as contagious. You know, we can see that and say, well, I, I should stay away from that. But complaining, that's the catchiest sin there is. Michael? Do you know one of the things I've learned to live with, thank you to the Bible? Be grateful for what you have and never regret what you don't have. Never regret. I like that, Michael. And, and one of the ironies is, you know, and Paul would go on to tell the Corinthians who all wanted the same gifts. They wanted... 1 Corinthians 12 says they all wanted the same gifts. He said, be glad with what you have. I like your point to say, not to regret what you don't. That's an important point for us all to consider. So the big question is this. Will anyone follow a complainer to heaven? Let's go back to what Tom said a second ago. Tom said, why is he a Christian? Tom, I really appreciate you saying it like that too. Why is he a Christian? He says, because Susie never complained about the church. What had happened? What would have happened? What could have happened? We don't know. What could have happened if that wasn't true? Could have seen a lot more football games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, I, that's an interesting point. I wasn't even thinking about that. But of course. Well, if she's complaining and he doesn't become a Christian to help support her, yeah. that could very easily happen. Absolutely. And by the way, you believe everything you say. That's an important truth we have to get ourselves to understand. When I say something, I'll believe myself. That, that's that part is most deceptive of all things passage in Jeremiah 17. That when I say things like, I'm so dumb, or I, you know, I always I always tell people, don't, don't put yourself down because you believe it. And it's usually not true. You know, I in fact I always, always, I just did it. What I'm about to say, don't do. I say, don't use words like always and never. We do it the right. We say, well, it always, things always fall apart for me. Ryan is terrible about that. It never works out for me. Those are both lies. I know they're lies. I hear myself say it. I believe it. 
And ironically, I'm poisoning myself. Anyone follow a complainer to heaven? What's a simple answer? No, your neighbors, if they hear you saying how much you don't like going to church, how much you wish you were doing those other things, they're going to say, well, I'm glad I'm not you. Glad I'm not you. You know, Paul would tell the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice, you know. Uh, Peter would say, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, that's an important verse we talk about a lot, about being ready with an answer. Do you remember what he said people would observe that you should be ready for an answer for? Facing good behavior. Well, he talked about, well, before that, actually, that's interesting, by the way. Back in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, where he said, you know, wives can convert their husbands without a word. That's a great point. I was thinking hope, joy. He says, for the hope that is within you. You know what Paul, Peter was suggesting? Peter was suggesting we should be the kind of people that, you know, the elections go or there's a war that starts and the next day at work, everybody's saying, oh, it's the most terrible thing. And you come in, you know, and what's wrong with you? Don't you know what's going on? Why do you have joy when the rest of us do? Why do you have hope when the rest of us are looking at the, the, at the giants we have to conquer and all you can see is the promised thing. You know, the world thinks we're foolish for this. But ironically, the world is self-destructing right around us. We've got to have this positive advantage. Sure. I was just thinking that at times I would be complaining about the way the government's running the country under the ground. All of a sudden, then I stop and think, wait a minute, I'm just passing through. Why yeah. do I care? Yeah. I'm just a visitor. <laughs> you know what's interesting about that, Gerald, is that that's one that I miss a lot. That I forget... Just like you said, my citizenship is in here. It's in heaven, Paul said. And, and I kind of lose sight of that a lot of times. Stephen? I would just, to uh, Gerald's point, the world is going to be the world. No matter which way, you know, when we hope for whatever, it's, it's going to be what it is. And there's not a lot of it, often that we can do about it. But we always have that hope and faith. Faith and hope that we have a much, much better place. Yeah. And that's all we really need to do. Yeah, and yeah. That's not all, but it certainly should be. If, Stephen, if we could keep our eye on the prize, not much else would make it too bad. If we could just get to our point to where we're saying, hey, it's worth it at the end, or it's worth it to get through this. If we could just trust those ideas, we'd make it. You know, I was, I was doing some work on Joseph recently in, in the Old Testament. One of the things I was thinking about is how is it Joseph didn't complain, right? His brothers sold him into slavery, lost everything. How is it he's not thinking, and boy, I hate my brothers, and I'd like to, you know, oh, I'd like to get them. Potiphar's wife betrays him. Potiphar throws him in jail. Potiphar's furious, doesn't believe him. Oh, I'd like to get that Potiphar. So whenever Joseph becomes the vizier of Egypt, becomes the prime minister, he goes out and gets revenge on him, right? You know, somebody pointed out something to me I hadn't noticed before. They said, do you notice that Joseph named his sons? What was it, Grant? You're the one who pointed it out. Was, no, maybe more. <laughs> Joseph, and I can't remember which son it was. Somebody help me out here. Ephraim and Manasseh. That Manasseh's name means God has fixed every problem I've got. I'm kind of paraphrasing. Well, he hasn't gotten his revenge against his brothers or against Pop. But Joseph would always say, remember when his brothers came to him and said, hey, don't kill us. And he says, guys, I know you didn't have the best intention, but what? Not good. Yes, but what you meant for evil, God worked out for good. I think Joseph, the more I think about Joseph, the more I think he's one of the greatest people in the Bible. The more I think about him, the more I think, you know what? Why don't I talk about him more? Fundamentally, he has an attitude that when he gets thrown into slavery, he says, well, you know what? Put my best to it. And when that blows up on him for doing the right thing, and he's in jail. What does he say? Well, you know what? I'm going to put my best to it. You know what? What promises did he have? God had told him in a dream one day, everybody will bow down. So that's kind of ambiguous. You know, our promises are very certain. There are things like, hey, if you resist temptation, you'll overcome it. Hey, you know, if you're faithful to the end, you'll get a crown of life. Hey, God's not going to give you anything you can't uh, take care of. Hey. Uh, you know, all your problems are temporary. God fixes things. Those are a lot better than what Joseph did. You know, we mess up. I should see a couple of hands up. Start with the end. I was thinking about what you were saying in, um, in 1 Peter chapter 3, um, like starting in verse 9, submission, submission in all of life. You cannot be turning evil for evil, insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead that you were called for the very purpose. 
that you might inherit a blessing. But let him who means to live life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and her lips from speaking guile and let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it for the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. So, and, and, and these verses right here are telling you exactly, you know what? What should we be doing? Yeah. And that's, and at the end, is that we should be, instead of looking at the worst of somebody, you know, we need to worry about ourselves yeah. and not worry about everybody else. Yeah, yeah. You know, again, Anthony, uh, our big point will be here in a moment. We should be fault fixers and not fault finders. Uh, and that's a huge transformation of the mind. Uh, Teresa, you were next. Uh, Joseph was doing what Paul tells us to do, which is to be content regardless of our circumstances. He had some pretty bad circumstances, though, Teresa. And yet, and by the way, he sure did one out of them. Remember when he told the baker, uh, not the baker, the, the, the cupbearer, hey, remember me? And that cupbearer did? No. You know, how many people let Joseph down in life? And yet, here's a guy that when his kids come around, he names them. God's always been good to me. God fixes all the problems. You know, uh, uh, that's incredible. And when he meets his brothers, it is a day. <laughs> Guess what I can do now? By the way, a little brother, I was a little brother. I used to relish and hope for the time that I'd be bigger than my brother and I could whip it. You know, that was my goal in life. <laughs> you know, how did Joseph not think of that thing? He doesn't. When he sees his brothers, he wants to verify they're good people now. But in the end, it has no, not even the slightest thought. That's remarkable. Who else had it again? Okay, so let's uh, uh, kind of, uh, I'm going to skip this point. I did want to make the point to say, here's Paul, and in first Corinthians, Second Corinthians 11, he'll tell the Corinthians, i got a lot of things to complain about. But then he says something remarkable. He says, you know what? I've learned to take pleasure in infirmities. In reproach and needs and persecution and distress for Christ's sake, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And that's something important for us to understand. But I want to kind of bring us uh, to our last points here, our last uh, uh, questions. I want to say, well, what do we do? Okay, I told you, I confess to you my sin. I groan. I complain. I find fault. Oh, and I, I, I don't want to do that. But you know, it's not enough just to say I'm doing what's wrong. Remember, your life is a cabinet. It's a drawer uh, that only has room for so many dishes. You've either got the fruits of the spirit or the works of the flesh. You can't have both. And that cabinet has to be full. Jesus said, you know, uh, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but, you know, a, a evil spirits pour it back. You know, you don't put good things back into place. Evil things come in there. It's not just about pulling grumbling out of the cabinet. I've got to put something in its place. So what's the opposite? Uh, let's start off with grumbling. Grumbling, let's let's kind of differentiate gum, grum, grumbling and complaining. Grumbling is maybe more subconscious. It's more of the, again, kind of, what, how do I, what do we do? What needs to go in the cabinet in the place of grumbling? What fits in there that'll fix things, Teresa? Positive thinking. Positive thinking. What's positive thinking like? Um, thinking on the good things and not <laughs> dwelling on things that aren't good. You know, it's so tempting to dwell on everything that's wrong. But like I said, what's interesting about a guy like Joseph is we know that his success in life meant he didn't do it, Bonnie. I was going to say something similar. I was thinking Philippians 4.8, uh, where Paul tells us what to focus on and what to think about. Yeah, what did he say? Do you remember? Whatever is true, true noble, right, noble, pure. Right, pure. Think on these things. Now, you know, that's kind of interesting because that's a positive thought process verse where he says think on these things this is what you need to be in your mind this fits in the cabinet nicely where grumbling went before Tasha or go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that you know it's garbage in garbage out we yeah. have to be aware of what we're taking in from our culture our culture is all negative <laughs> and, and it, it, there's you know good news is buried on you know page 102 right it's you have to be uh, discerning in what you let into your ears and eyes and let me, let me throw one out there Monique you're, you're hinting around it and I'll just say one I have to struggle with a lot is is news you know because <laughs> news is sensational and it's bad 
And there's a lot of times where I'll watch the news and I'll walk away just kind of depressed, thinking, oh, we're on the verge of, I don't know, you know, last month we were on the verge of an ice age, now we're on the verge of a heat wave. And, and it's not even clicking in my mind. Wait a second. So it's interesting you say that because news is a tough one for me. I'm not saying, by the way, don't ever watch the news, but I have to be careful and I have to have a good filter on my eye to filter out what's wrong, not just to have a darkness filter. Tasha, you were going to say something. No. Uh, Becky, go ahead. Uh, replace grumbling with gratitude. Gratitude. That's actually the second one I was thinking of, too, with complaining as well. Being grateful. Being grateful is huge. It changes everything about your life. Being grateful for what you have. It, it, it's, and I realize that a lot of times it becomes almost a trite statement after blessing. But the truth of the matter is, that's what these really successful people could do. You know, I was just reading today where, where Jesus had the... Uh, the 70 come back, and Jesus was so happy. You know, and, and I have to think about this. It seems to me like there's a lot of times where Jesus isn't happy. Jesus was happy a lot. I'm just thinking that if I had been Jesus, I wouldn't have been happy. And I realized, well, it's a good thing. I, I'm not the one relying on to, Because Jesus could be celebrate and happy and rejoice over a lot of things when all I think of is all the bad things. In fact, where I think about it a lot, I think... If I knew in three years' time, I start preaching, at the end of this, there's going to be a horrendous death, that's all I can think about. And Jesus it clearly doesn't. Right. You know, one of the amazing abilities to human mind is that we can agonize over the tiniest negative things for you know, days and days and ignore everything that's good. Um, you know, I think the hard part of this isn't finding good things to fill up. It's, you know, Turning ourselves to focus on it. So I think if we're really looking for good things to take the place of this, yes. it's not given. Yeah, that's that's a great point. We're coming up in our time. And the big idea that I need us to walk away with, the thing that I think we need to a a walk out the door saying, okay, this is what I've got to do. Let's change the third one from fault finding to fault fixing. You know, we're gonna find faults with each other or with things. We're going to say, hey, I'm not happy about that or something like that. <clears throat> what you've got to put in your mind is that you will never complain again without bringing some type of fix. And that's how Paul worked. In 1 Corinthians, Paul didn't just say, hey, you guys got a problem. He says, you got a problem. Here's how you fix it. You will no longer be fault finders, which sometimes we do because we think we're actually doing something good. We're not. You will be fault fixers. And from now on, when you see things that are problematic, you bring them to it. I got Anthony, Cal, and then we're done. Go ahead. <laughs> and all that, what you were saying about what's the opposite and how we fix it, you always remind me of the Beatitudes. You know, yeah. Blessed are the poor spirit, for they are the kingdom of, of heaven. Um, blessed are those who mourn, for they should be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they should inherit the, the earth. Blessed are those who hungry and thirsty, white, for they should be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they should receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they should see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Yeah, and that's the result. You know, that in the end is... All this, in the end, this is what God wants. God wants you to be with Him. That's fantastic. Alex, what was The other day, uh, you know, driving home from church, I complained to Richie, like you were saying. Richie's my go-to complainer. And uh, then we got together, and we started seeing number 55. Yeah. Because that's a big complaint to me. Wow, it's time to start. Why aren't people sitting down? Complain, complain. So we start singing, boom, everybody, so we fix it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Simple fix. Yes. Fault fixers. That's yeah. what I want you to be. You're going you're gonna to bring the solution. Uh, thanks for a great class tonight. I really appreciate all your thoughts and comments tonight. And I uh, uh, guess we can let the kids out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to grab your songbooks and turn with me. Uh, actually, go ahead and mark your songbooks. Um, song number 326. <laughs> mark your songbooks, song number 326. That would be the song after the invitation tonight. And then, in fact, you've marked that, like, turn with me to song number 35. Song number 35. Worship the King. How do you feel up to it? Let's stand. Oh, worship the King of all your sing. His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, a million in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care was a it brings in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the lake, and sweetly it stills in the dew and the rain. fear. What is fear? Where it comes from? Uh, what are you afraid of? Now, fear is mentioned 437 times in the Bible. 27 times is just the topic of fear that's in there. And oftentimes, fear means the respect that we have for God, that we know how that we have. 
there was a saying going around several years ago that I ran across that says fear pushes until desire pulls. Now sometimes it's the fear that we have that we pushes us into a situation that we know of. Uh, Genesis 9 talks about God putting the fear into the animals. The animals are scared of man because God put that fear there. The dread of being eaten probably. But there is a fear there that animals have and they will go away from man. Uh, the fear of God uh, is mentioned a lot in the Old Testament. Uh, Fear causes us uh, a lot of times to do things that we normally wouldn't do. Abraham, for example, had lied and said Sarah was his sister. He knew there was no fear of God where he was, but he feared them, and so he lied. Um, you have fear of harm. Uh, they feared Pharaoh. Uh, the Israelites feared the people of uh, uh, the people in Canaan. But the thing to get over this fear until that desires uh, pulls, is building a relationship. And in relationships, we have attitudes and we develop attitudes out of finite uh, facts that we learn. Uh, like the kids in school, uh, we were talking about their classes and how those facts, sometimes they don't like learning them. They're boring. Sometimes the teacher's boring in presenting them. But we develop attitudes out of these facts, and some of the facts in building a relationship uh, is basically the beginning of love. Uh, 1 Corinthians it talks about love, and I really like the way it begins in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, if he speaks in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. So we see with this relationship in love that we start not fearing God, but desiring to be with God. And so this love draws us closer to God, and then we do away with the fear. Um, I can't remember where it's found, but fear not those that can kill the body, but that but the man, but him, that can kill both body and soul. That's fearful words, but we've gotten past that. Many of us have gotten past that. And that the love or the desire to be with God, the fellowship that we've talked about in the last few weeks. We have fellowship with Christ. We have that relationship with Christ. I mean, in that fellowship with Christ, we have a relationship with each other that goes beyond fear. It is a love, a concern that we have for each other. This love, First John talks about, because there is no fear in love. A perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We want to end with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And those that will be baptized will have everlasting life. So these invitation that we have might be out of fear that you got you have sin you know your sin and you want to overcome that fear but that light that draws you in that love that draws you in and the way that you work at overcoming that fear of being baptized of having faith being with those you love being here tonight that's that relationship. We invite you to join that relationship. If you felt that you've uh, fallen out of that relationship, please come on up. And someone will gladly talk to you.
When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what glory He sheds on our way, while He still begins to will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but the toils we have richly repaid. Not a grief for us, not a crown or a cross. But this blessing we trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says we will go. several people uh, to help you feel isolating. Linda Durham is not feeling well. Jim Kent had oral surgery today and his face hurts. Um, Wendy was not able to be with us when we came. And Paula Pesci uh, is in the hospital for a couple more days. She uh, had some complications with her appendix. So. Um, also, traveling, we have Mark Westfall, of course, Lamar, I think, is coming back this week, and the Haynes, the older Haynes, <laughs> the bald one, and the white, are traveling um, this weekend. Um, also, we're going to have, after the prayer, a few minutes for the men to get together to discuss about the building stuff, and guessing and scheduling possibly another meeting. So, do that with me. Dear 
Dear Father in heaven, we come before you on this glorious day that you've given us. Father, we pray that this day was accepted in your sight. We thank you so much that you give us this opportunity to come together and study, look into your word, to let it fill our hearts that we can be a light unto the world. Father, it is in our nature as human beings to complain and be unhappy with the situation around us. Help us to focus on what is true and right and right, that we may share it with everybody as we go forth. Be with our leaders during this time of struggle. Be with this country that you've blessed so much. May we again return to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. So if I can have the guys up here just for a second, uh, just to chat for just a moment about some building. Uh, some building. So what are you working on? Anybody who wants that's just fine. Well, yeah. Oh, dude. Uh, well, guys, what we want to talk about just really quickly is that uh, and Al, Al yeah. wanted to have more of the information. So the Congress made the back for the renovation work. And uh, so we also done a lot of work trying to find other guys, and we're just not going to find someone. Uh, we're going to have to just pay a lot. So this, what, what this kind of means is um, we're going to go through what we've set up to use pretty quickly, Ooh. it looks like, between this and Al said we found some electrical issues. We now have to find out what it sounds like it doesn't want to turn the title. Sounds good. One where the building is no longer considered a bank. Mm -hmm. Instead, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. takes us mm -hmm. to the type A building. Mm -hmm. So the electrical has to be all around. Yeah. I know. I did. I should have done it when he was here. It's a little bit metal. It should be, but the flexible is just a so anyway, that means all of the ceiling tile comes out, all of the million wires out there have to come out and get replaced with metal flat. So um, our plumbing went from 15 to 18 down to 38,000. The electrical he was expecting, and we haven't got the thing yet because he was there for a we kind of figured that the electrical might get 25 or 30 cents. No. That's our budget right there. Those two things could be so then we have to do concrete there it is and we have to take out that teller window we have to replace the in in the back corner of the building where it's a door that swings in it has to be wider and it has to swing out so that's six thousand dollars plus we have to fix the sheetrock we have 3400 square feet which is what when we figure 280, almost 280 yards of carpet wow. and linoleum. And so ten or twelve thousand dollars in flooring. Yes. And we have to buy uh, just a few doors, brand new doors, door jams, and then typical little things like mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> Some dispensers, or some of that was they slammed us in. So we'll have hundreds of dollars worth in little things. I'm sure but when it comes it. down to the bottom, not in 70 or 80s, is that we're probably going to be bumping the road this week. That's right. And we're probably not going to be able to get through all this till like February. Because that's more realistic. That is huge. 
So that's because they hired a contractor, a contractor who has subs that will come when you're boss. Because well, the, the other, other three plumbers we thought wouldn't even give us the time of day. So best plumbers right now are only plumbers. Did the job when they didn't work. They were planning this bad. I hope. Okay. I hope. 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 Plumbers changed oh, jobs, okay. and, and one of them gave us the best. Well, the other three. Ryan is our contract. Ryan, 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 Ryan,